Thank you. I have to do it. Thank you. Okay, so we're going to kick off this meeting with the speaker series, and I'm going to turn it back over to Hannah. Hey, welcome, Levi. Thanks for joining us. I'm going to um, turn it back over to Hannah to introduce and tell us a little bit about the speaker program we have going on today. Thanks. Um, so yeah, I'm pleased to introduce our mini speaker series, Perspectives on the Salish Sea, where we'll hear from four presenters on their work around place-based knowledge in this region. I'm really excited for the diversity of perspectives and lenses of our four presenters, um, which will be kind of from going from micro to macro and including the past, present and future, as well as seasonal findings and reflections on this beautiful bioregion. Um, due to our time limitations, we unfortunately won't have time for direct questions from the speakers, uh, for the speakers, but we'd like to invite you to connect via the chat if you have um, questions and comments. And speakers, if you feel comfortable being contacted, please feel free to put your details into the chat as well. Our first speaker is Sadie Olson, co-founder of White Swan Environmental. And I'll let, Sadie, I'll let you introduce um, yourself further. Um, and her presentation is called The Salmon People Are Worth Saving. Now, Sam. I squile nostalgia e CM e salalukla e c salalukla. Heishka quasomat sana sna cha uklamisen e at husanet sin. So it's an ohiluk quinnis athla atiakayas. Nukchisen maqualia quinnis anatachal. Miss Delete Quinn Squall, Aqua Quino Squall, Outsen Kachit Sauklumi Chasen, E Utatasen Quinnis Twin Outs. Squalowens E Cha Nukhlami Tenguch. Heishka Atia Skeno H. J. Hello, good day, my friends and relatives, and my relatives who are passed on and my relatives who are passed on before them. I am thankful to be here today with Immerse from AGM. My traditional name is Quasalmut, which has been passed down from my mom, and she got her name from our grandma Sadie, who got her name from our grandma Hannah. And we are from the Lummi Nation, and we're also from the Saanich Nation in BC, which is um, Saanich, and it's located on Vancouver Island. I'm happy to see all of you here today. I'm thankful that you can all be here. I just want to say a few words. I don't know the Lummi language, and I am still learning how to speak it. We are one mind, one heart one people, and we are from the territory of the Lummi people. Haishka, thank you for your good work. I am a co-founder of a native-led nonprofit organization called White Swan Environmental, and our vision is to support community healing for the natural, cultural, and historical restoration to the Salish Sea for seventh generation sustainability. Our vision is to support seven longhouses in the San Juan Islands and seven longhouses in the Gulf Islands for a kindergarten through PhD, mountain to sea, reef to reef, Coast Salish Tribal Heritage Field Institute. We first started our organization in 2014 and we've really grown our support system and our network of amazing alliances throughout the years and now it's 2021 and we're working with Andrew and I just want to acknowledge that we were recently awarded um, the Indigenous Communities Fellows Award for the we Digital Ecocultural Mapping Project, which Andrew has been helping us with. And that is a project that's going to allow us to provide our communities with different levels of what our environment is providing for us, 
whether it's on a cultural level or a linguistic level or a biological level and all of the different types of life forms that we have to protect and everything that we're doing is for our future generations. It's also based on what we've learned from our elders over the past, um, I mean, the past lifetime, we've had a lot of elders giving us different sorts of wisdom and even support systems who have been on our um, elder advisory board. Our most recent um, elder who passed away was Sam Salik and he was the hereditary chief of the Lemmy Nation. And he had shared some knowledge with us about how our native medicines are, or our native plants are medicines. Our songs are medicines. And those are things that we have to offer forward to our people. And those are our strengths. And those are things that we have to know that we are, we, that we come from those. And um, that will provide us with the strengths for our future. So it was really amazing to hear some of the knowledge she had to share. Um, our Another person who's on our elder advisory board is Saseya Thut, and that is Paul Wagner's mother, Mary Wagner. Paul Wagner is one of our board members. So if you look at the website I linked in the chat box, you can see um, who's on our board and who's our co-founders and who is our elder advisory board. And we've recently came up with the um, White Swan Environmental Interns. So that's been a collaboration between AmeriCorps, Northwest Indian College and White Swan Environmental. And that's really a bridge that needed to be built for a very long time. So I'm really grateful that we built it and I'm so excited to see the curriculum that the interns help provide for our future, um, as well as their participation in the SOS coalition development. So SOS stems back from um, my father. He has recently connected to his relationship with our relatives in Canada and they're reef netting people. And so we used to reef net all in the San Juan Islands and all in the Gulf Islands in the Salish Sea. And it was something that provided us sustenance and a relationship to our waters. And I know that I'm coming up to the end of, ending of my time here, so I'm going to try to speed up. But um, it's been really amazing because we were able to bridge some of those native connections that we've lost due to colonization and um, provide spaces in the National Park Services um, land areas, land monuments, to put up story poles that connect our families as well as create a coalition of Spirit of the Shkwala, um, basically members. So what our interns are doing now through our program is helping to widen that connection of Spirit of the Shkwala Coalition. And we've based our methodologies on the Community Engagement Fellows out of Western Washington University. Um, Back to Saseya thought she has been there the whole entire time and she really shares some important memories that she has from the boarding school era. And it just goes to show what our elders carried over all of this time. And um, she really empathizes for the youth who don't have a lot to hang on to sometimes. And so she really wants us to take initiative and grasp onto our strengths and what we have available to us and provide that because without that, we can't continue our culture and we can't continue to know who we are if we don't acknowledge our strengths and the gifts that our community has to give us. And then um, John Elliott, he is from Canada and he's a language speaker. So I plan on going to UVic University of Victoria to study environmental law and learn Sanchothan from him. Eventually, um, after I get my bachelor's degree in native environmental science from Enwick. And it's just been overall a wonderful time <laughs> seeing this whole network grow. And I hope to see um, us all 
Utilizing our strengths and offering those forward to our indigenous relations and learning from our elders in our community. Um, because we can, we are gifted by the creator and there is something that you have to listen to within yourself to offer forward. And that's something that I really value in um, indigenous cultures. And I just wanna share, those were um, knowledge that's knowledge that I've gained from my own land, but I've also been able to do travel throughout different areas of the world. Um, so I went to California and there was the indigenous 20 something project who shared knowledge um, about what they learned from their communities and their, um, they actually were pulled out of their public school curriculum and brought into their indigenous communities just to learn their culture. And they, had to share with us at a quarterly board meeting that we are the ones who breathe the fire or breathe life into the fire of our people. So our elders have been keeping our fire alive for so long and now it's our job to keep the fire alive for our future generations. And in New Zealand, they say the same thing. Um, our water is connected to our forests and they have a story about one of their whales. Their whale populations was connected to a sacred tree and nobody believed them. And the tree ended up getting polluted by the toxins that were on our, on our shoes. So when I went to go visit them, we had to walk on a bridge and dust off our shoes and wash off our shoes with water and scrape them off and get all those toxins off and then walk on a bridge to go see one of the last standing sacred trees. And they said that that tree was connected to their whale so as that population of trees has declined, their whale population has also declined. So I think it's really important that we acknowledge the connections that we have between nature and our sacred marine life, like, like the shtenuch, the salmon, or the kusalamichtin, the orca whales, as we were talking about in the beginning, because those are so important to us and what we see as the Salish Sea. So. There's a lot for us to protect and that eelgrass provides 2.5 times more oxygen than, than any forest can because of how much oxygen it just provides for our people. Um, so there's all different sorts of ecological health that we need to focus on and it will help improve our physical health of our, of our people. Haishka for your time and consideration and I'm excited to hear the rest of the speakers. Thank you so much, Sadie. I'm really looking forward to learning more about all the amazing work that you are doing and um, working together on some projects. Um, so our next uh, speaker is Ad Emily Adamczyk. Um, she is a PhD candidate in zoology at UBC and will be presenting her work on eelgrass communities in her talk, Seasons in the Salish Sea. Thank you for the introduction, Hannah. Can everybody hear me? And can everybody see my slide? Yes, okay, great. Um, first, I just want to say thank you to Sadie for sharing the knowledge with us. It was very nice to hear those stories. And, uh, um, uh, can I interrupt, Emily? Yes. Um, could you uh, make your sound a little louder? So I can make them dry. Let's see. Um, is, this, is this any better? Yeah, that got a little better. Did you just switch to your computer mic? It's funny, I have three different or four different settings. <laughs> Let's see. Um, it did improve when you changed whatever you changed. Okay, so is this okay right now? Yeah, it's better. Okay, great. I will try to speak louder. Um, yes, okay, so thank you again, Hannah, for the introduction. Um, so today I will give a brief overview of one of my PhD chapters that focuses on the seasonality of eelgrass associated invertebrates. I would like to begin by acknowledging that I am currently living on the traditional and unceded territory 
of the Musqueam, Squamish, Tolo, and Tsleil-Waututh nations as a settler in North America. All of my research has been conducted on First Nations land, including Tawasan, where this picture takes place. And this is the site of the research I will be sharing with you today. For some background context, eelgrass is a marine vascular plant that grows in protected bays and estuaries throughout the Northern Hemisphere. This particular eelgrass meadow is located at the Sawasan Ferry Terminal and extends into Point Roberts. It is just one of the many eelgrass meadows that can be found in the Sealer Sea. My lab mate, John Cristiani, recently published this map that shows where eelgrass meadows have been documented throughout this region. The green represents eelgrass and blue represents freshwater inputs. Note that the polygons are exaggerated a bit for visualization, but I just wanted to show you this map to highlight that eelgrass ecosystems are commonly found in this part of the world. This tiny red circle is where the Sawasan eelgrass meadow is located right on the border of BC and Washington. And here's a close-up map of the eelgrass meadow. The green area is the estimated extent of the eelgrass as it extends into Point Roberts, but we don't have data for Washington, so it doesn't actually have that cutoff line there. Um, but next time you take a trip to Sawasan or anywhere from the ferry terminal, see if you can spot some of the eelgrass. So eelgrass meadows, such as this one in Sawasan, provide ecosystem services that people rely on, including shoreline protection, carbon storage, water filtration, and acts as a nursery for juvenile fish that we like to eat, including salmon. From the surface, you can see that the canopy of the eelgrass is quite dense, creating a perfect habitat for juvenile fish. In fact, eelgrass is a foundation species that provides habitat for many different organisms. And this is a photo of a different eelgrass meadow that is occupied by a school of shiner perch, which are commonly found in eelgrass meadows during the summertime. These are just some of the animals that I've seen while diving in eelgrass meadows. And you can see that there is a high diversity of life. However, the presence of eelgrass associated animals changes with each season, just as the presence of animals change with the seasons on land. Seasonal patterns on land can be mirrored by the patterns that we see in the ocean. For instance, birds migrate just as fish do, and terrestrial flowers bloom around the same time as eelgrass flowers. So the main research objective that I have for this project is to identify key seasonal events in eelgrass communities. And the purpose of this is to create a baseline understanding for when certain species are present in eelgrass meadows throughout the year. And with this information, we can better inform restoration and management objectives. So to identify key seasonal events, we made field observations in the Swasson eelgrass meadow, focusing on different parts of the food web. And so here we have an eelgrass food web where eelgrass is at the base and followed by epiphytic algae that live on eelgrass leaves and invertebrates graze on the epiphytic algae. And those invertebrates are eaten by small juvenile fish, which in turn, are consumed by salmon and flatfish like halibut, and then top predators like herons, eagles, and otters. And I would like to draw your attention to the first four parts of this web, which are the focus of my research. The eelgrass, the epiphytic algae, the invertebrates, and the fish. So here's just a brief overview of the data that we collected. 
So myself and a team of colleagues and friends did monthly surveys where we collected eelgrass biomass and density, invertebrate diversity and abundance, fish diversity and abundance, and also abiotic variables like temperature and salinity and nutrients. And we collected these data every month for three years. Here is another view of the meadow where you can see the ferry terminal in the background. And in this photo, you can see that the eelgrass is in shallow water. And that's because we would collect the samples at low tide. And we would use the pictured 25 by 25 centimeter quadrat to standardize our sampling area. In the summertime, it is easy to sample because low tides were during the day during in the summer months. So we would easily be able to do our fish staining and collections of eelgrass. And in the winter time, the low tides shifted to being at night. So we would have to go out in the wee hours of the night and collect our eelgrass and fish then. And it was quite wonderful to go during these different times of day and different seasons because we were able to see the different types of fish and invertebrates. So I have not yet finished my taxonomy work for all of the invertebrate samples that I collected but I just want to show you a visual representation for how species and abundance of the invertebrates change seasonally. So here we are starting with winter. And I just want to note that these photos are from the samples of that 25 by 25 centimeter quadrat. So it's just a small area of that eelgrass and the associated invertebrates. So here is winter. And then we go into the spring, we can notice there are already some changes in terms of the abundance of invertebrates. And in the summer, especially in June and July, there's far less inverts than in the winter time. And then here we are in the fall where the abundance picks up again. And I would like to ask the audience, do you have any ideas for why invertebrate abundance is so much lower in the spring and summer? Predators. Predators. It's an excellent guess, Andrew. So yes, we hypothesize that the decrease in the invertebrates in the spring is driven by the predation of fish specifically the shiner surf perch who swim into the eelgrass in the summertime and they give live birth and they'll end up having lots of babies that eat those invertebrates. I would also like to share with you the seasonal trends of the eelgrass and epiphytes that we collected throughout this time. Here are two figures. On the left-hand panel is eelgrass, and on the right-hand panel is the epiphytic algae. The different years are represented by different colors, and month is on the x-axis, and biomass is on the y-axis. And we can see from these two figures that the peak biomass, so when biomass is greatest, happens during the summer months. It's a little less clear for algae, but we're working to figure out why that's the case. And this is what you would expect because during the summer, there's a lot more sunlight. So these organisms are able to photosynthesize and increase their biomass. And this is just an average representation. So you can see that on average over time, the peak biomass does indeed happen during the summer. All right, so going back to my main research objective to identify the key seasonal events in these systems. So as a preliminary results, we did find that seasonal events in eelgrass communities, such as China perch migration, can influence the species interactions. And for the next steps, 
we are aiming to create a model for organizing hypotheses and observations for the key events in eelgrass communities throughout BC. And we also are aiming to compare key events to other eel, eelgrass meadows worldwide in order to further understand how these ecosystems are similar or different and why. And with that, I would like to thank Immerse for giving me this wonderful opportunity to present my work and to all of you for being here. And I would also like to thank my funding sources and collaborators and my lab. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emily. That was really interesting. And those photos are beautiful. Thank you. Photos over the season as well. Um, so I would now like to introduce our third speaker, Dr. Martin Whale, uh, who's the president and CEO of SIMRES, Saturna Island Marine Research and Education Society. And he will be speaking on citizen science, whales, and noise pollution. Thank you. Can you hear me? Can anybody hear me? Yep. I can hear you. Oh, that's good. Okay. Thank you. Um, I may need to share my screen. Let's figure out how to do that. Okay, can you all see that? Yep. Okay, thank yeah. you very much. So I'm Martin Whale um, from Simres. Simres is a small nonprofit charity based on Tech Texan. And I'd like to acknowledge, which is where I'm speaking from, and I'd like to acknowledge the ancestral territories of the Coast and Straits Salish peoples, particularly the Sayot and Sakem nations, their pre Confederate Douglas Treaty rights, and their asserted Aboriginal rights and title in this area. Um, we couldn't obviously do the work without being here. Simrez has had hydrophones in Boundary Pass since 2014 and is part of the BC Coast Hydrophone Network with Orca Lab and the North Coast Cetacean Society. And we've been widely active in cetacean research and education in collaboration with Simon Fraser University, University of Victoria and others. What I want to talk to you about today, and I'm conscious of the time, is the uh, work that we've done with the Saturna and, Pen and now Penda um, Cetacean Sightings Network. Similar is because it's a non-profit, um, can't do advocacy, but we work closely with the Sighters Network, many of whom do do advocacy, and that air gap serves us actually very well. These are our sightings. All the data I'm going to present is from the last sighting season. We haven't analyzed the data from this year yet. So we're talking about uh, 12 months up until March of 2020. And there are a couple of uh, significant findings we had during that time. There we go. So during that period, we saw whales on 183 days and total number of killer whale and humpback sightings during that period was 417. And the methodology that we use excludes additional sightings within 90 minutes, unless we can photo confirm them as different animals. We're very pleased with the way the sighters have really stepped up to doing this work. We use um, high resolution photography. We use military grade laser range finders for measure distance. And we use a variety of other things. And so if, if a, a whale or a group of whales comes through, particularly past the East Point on Saturna, we will get multiple sightings of them as they move past. And that means if somebody doesn't get a good photograph and we can't identify, we pick them up later on. So excluding the um, uh, repeat sightings, that gives us just over 1,600 cetaceans in that area um, during the year, uh, which is a higher number than we anticipated. And just to give you, I just need to get rid of this 
thing from Zoom because I can't see the slide captions. You go up to the top where it says view. Yeah, there we go. Okay, that's lovely. Okay, um, so these are the uh, species types and, and ecotypes and the southern residents and bigs um, orcas, very prevalent, but we saw a lot of humpback whales and a lot of porpoises. And I'll just run through quite quickly um, how this works. So, there we go. So, during, and uh, Lucy Quayle is on the line, and, and I would like to acknowledge her work in this area. And we did some very high level photo identification during that period. Uh, from April to November 2020. During that time, 255 uniquely identified whales, of which 179 were only seen once. And we saw all three pods of southern residents. We saw 13 different matriline family groups of pigs. And we had 12 humpback whales positively identified with multiple sightings over multiple days. And particularly in June, we had a humpback mother called Heather and her calf, subsequently called Neowise, who were in the area. This is Heather and Neowise. Um, Heather is obviously the larger animal, but the, the really thing, the thing, the really cute thing about this photograph is that you can see Heather's eye and she's looking at me while I'm taking the photograph. So these are southern residents. Um, we didn't see any during the period. Uh, during May, um, June, but then in late June, and after that, they started to come back. This year has been even more pronounced. We didn't see any until September, and since then, they've been coming back. So it does look like there's a shift in the pattern towards um, southern residents, in particular, being more present in the winter. And we're already talking about how we change our um, student projects in particular to actually have them here when the whales are here. That's a southern resident. For biggest whales, it's much more consistent all year round. And yeah, bigs. And for humpbacks, this is quite interesting. So the peak during on the left hand side of the slide down here is Heather and Neowise when they were around in in uh, June in particular. What happened there was the ferry strike by the Washington State Ferry at Macultio, and all the humpbacks disappeared pretty much for months. Now that was interesting. I also wanted to show you this because this was uh, recorded off the north coast of, um, of uh, Saturna, and it's quite an unusual finding. I was out there uh, photographing one day and came across this, this patch of turbulent water with a bit of whale activity around there. There's clearly some humpbacks going on. And then it all went quiet. And then suddenly this erupted out of the bottom. And this is bubble net fishing. And although it's been reported in this area on a couple of occasions, I'm not aware of any other photographs. Um, of bubble net fishing in this part of the world. So, thank you for listening to me. Um, what's missing from this picture? One of the things that I would very much appreciate and, and, and we would very much like is to have relations with the First Nations that are interested in this area so that we can understand and, and and get input from their leadership and their perspective. We've got a lot of information about whales. We'd love to work together. How do we work together so that uh, we can support you and, and each other's benefit from this? I'd like to make that offer at this meeting. Finally, I'd like to uh, thank my collaborator, Susie, Susie Washington Smythe and all the Citers on Saturna and now on Pender and Maine. Lucy, Maureen, Sanjeev, who does the data, our members, volunteers, and board members, 
and also the students and staff of the Saturna Edu Environmental Education Centre see. Thank you very much for listening to me. Thank you, Martin. Thanks so much. That was great to see a little bit of the, um, the patterns of whale presence in this area and some of the photos as well. Um, so our, our next speaker is Dr. Elaine Humphrey, one of our wonderful board members and lab manager at UVic Advanced Microscopy Lab. Um, who will take us on a microscopic journey in her latest session, Micro Explorations. Uh, thanks, thanks, thanks. Wait a minute, PowerPoint. Shoot, I just had it. Oh, and then share screen. Oops, that. Um, Okay, and get rid of you there, right. So, um, of course, Immerse AGM is the Institute of Multidisciplinary Ecological Research of a Salish Sea and a great micrographs. I should have put this in there. So the goals of my talks are always, no one is to go to sleep, and I want at least one wow from every member of the audience. Fortunately, with electron microscopy, that's not too difficult. Sometimes. One of our projects has been following on from um, Emily's talk, looking at the wee beasties that live on the eelgrass. And in Immerse, we've got Mark Weber and Arian on Galliano. At UBC, we've got Siobhan in the Laura Palfrey lab. And here at UVic, we've got me and I have two volunteers, Melanie, Quenneville and Ron Reed, and they heard one of the talks that Mark and Siobhan and I did, and they're both retired. And Melanie's retired from iOS, and she said, oh, I was bored. Uh, I retired, but then I got bored, so can I volunteer? And she's been great, because she knows a lot about the taxonomy of diatoms. Ron Reed was a doctor who also decided that he'd like to learn electron microscopy, and they've been coming in once a week for the last few months, taking pictures of stuff for us, this kind of picture. So when you look at the eelgrass, you can see all these are diatoms. Now, all these look very much similar. They're like coca beans and they're coconeus, but that's not the usual thing that we find. What we find is this quite a mess of diatoms. There are so many species. We've, we're up to about 46 species now, and they're all kind of different. So with the school kids, when I because I do projects with school kids and they come in via Zoom, and we use the tabletop SEM, uh, we're looking at a piece of eelgrass that I picked up floating in the sea and dried down. And we're, with, with the kids, we don't look at these as species. We look at these at what do they remind you of? And there are, gosh, one, two, three. There's so many species in here. All I can say is I am glad that I don't have to count this. So here you can see we have the French fries and the pillow and the guitar. Um, well, I'm not sure about that one. And then this is part of this particular program with the tabletop. So this we, Hitachi gave me this tabletop scanning electron microscope for outreach programs in schools and community groups. So if you have a school child and you can talk to the teacher, ask them to get in touch with me. My email is easy, ech at uvic.ca. But we decided that part of the MS program, once a month, we would have an, a session, an evening session. Uh, and we've already had the first one on the eelgrass. When we looked at eelgrass and we saw the diatoms, and this is a uh, coconeus scutellum, but uh, this one isn't, I don't think. 
Hmm. And then there's this little one down here, which we've called the biscotti. So we get round ones like frisbees, we get Toblerones, uh, like triangles, we get peanuts or guitars, and there's, there's a different kind of cocoa bean. Um, the October version we've decided is going to be slime molds and plant bits. And fortunately, Pam is an expert on slime molds. So she sent me some slime molds, here's one, and I noticed these very, very shiny bits. I mean, they were shiny. Like, like little jewels. Which is why I like slime molds. <laughs> <laughs> and they're all different. And so when I put it under the electron microscope, that very shiny bit is not shiny. And that takes us into why electron microscopes use electrons and there's no color in electrons unless you color them in afterwards. But when you look at the spores, they're very heavily sculptured and every species has a different shape. So this one is hemitrichia, and it's totally different. So we're going to explore some of that. But this is a pansy petal. So in October, we're going to look at plant parts as well. Who knew that the petal on pansies was heavily sculptured like this? And there's little pollen grains down here, which we could zoom in on. Um, it's a live thing. So there we go. Uh, and that's all I am um, going to say for now. I was told to keep it short. Uh, we could go on and on and on with lots and lots of electromicrographs, but I'm keeping it short. Uh, and hopefully we'll see you in October. Thank you, Elaine. Yeah, so amazing. So beautiful. I saw lots of wows, Elaine. <laughs> yeah, I think you got some wows. Sweet. Um, yeah, thanks. Everyone, there's a full wealth of knowledge among us, and it's it's really inspiring um, to hear about your work. And I know this only scratches the surface of all that you do. Um, and so, yeah, we hope to keep these conversations going and learn more from you in the future. Um, so I'll now pass it back to Chris as we head into the AGM. Can we just take a moment? How amazing was that? That is so cool. I hadn't seen any of the slime mold stuff before. I'm really excited for those sessions. Sadie, you're doing super inspiring work and I'm happy to see that you're gonna connect with March in there. Um, just th thanks everyone for showing up and doing that. It really adds a, like a cool level of flavor to this, uh, to this meeting. And we're gonna share that with the world. So that's, that's pretty sweet. Um, at this point, we're Can gonna- Can I interrupt in. here? Yeah. Um, I think these, talks I have enjoyed so much other than mine um, I think we should include some other talks in our evening sessions maybe in our in our pr weekly pr presentations the chair hears your suggestion and makes note of it it's a great idea also you know I always want to hear a shout out for the marshmallow diatoms and they were clearly there in the peanut shot and in other shots and they didn't get any leveling I'm sorry. I'm so sorry. I meant to say that. And I did have a slide and it didn't get put in. But I, hey, right. I was told, keep it short. All right. All right. We'll give you another chance next AGM. <laughs> um, at this point, uh, the schedule calls for me to um, allow the people who are going to be presenting here to introduce themselves. That's going to be Janine, um, who's going to talk a little bit about our strategic planning process. Um, I'm going to give an overview from the communications committee. Andrew is going to give us a little bit of a deeper dive into um, a bunch of our programs and updates, as well as the biodiversity data science and the microclimate monitoring. And uh, Pam's going to help guide us through the, uh, the election of the directors and stuff. So at this point, I just wanted to give each of the current immersed directors a quick chance to introduce themselves. Why don't we start with Elaine? You're muted, Elaine. Uh, I was pressing the wrong button. <laughs> uh, okay, so I am. Uh, I was trained as a marine biologist and biological oceanographer, and then when I was doing my PhD, I got into electron microscopy. So marine biology is cool, but electron microscopy is way cool. And if you can put the two together, it's awesome. And the immersed program has allowed me to do just that, and I can indulge wonderfully. 
I am now the lab manager of the advanced microscopy facility at the University of Victoria. And we have bragging rights because we have one of the highest resolution microscopes in the world. It's, um, it does picometers, so it can look at atoms, but you've seen one atom, you've seen them all. Uh, and the tabletop SEM is much more versatile in that you can look at all kinds of things. And, and we have fun with it, with the schools. So don't forget, if you have children in school, just let the teacher know that they can join me in a scanning electron. Okay. Great, thank you very much. Pam, I wanna jump over to you for an introduction. Hi, I live on Saturna Island. Um, I am a naturalist. I did fungus studies and inventories for about 20 years and then I switched over to studying um, slime molds, which are now my passion. And, um, and much to my horror, I discovered I was the BC expert because um, I feel nothing like an expert, but there you go. Um, and I'm the, let's see, we're working on a, a um, slime mold field guide for BC. And I'm also a Merce's treasurer for now. And that's enough. Hannah, you're up next. Would you please give a quick introduction? Yeah. Um, hi, I am uh, my name's Hannah. I have a background in forest conservation advocacy and as well as a number of um, creative practices that I like to look at how we can integrate those into um, ecological research and advocacy. Um, I'm currently a PhD student looking at um, using data visualization to better communicate the role of forests in climate change mitigation, as well as um, the climate risks of forest mismanagement. Um, yeah, that is me. Thanks, Anna. And Hannah um, helped a lot with pulling together the speaker series today and bringing everyone together. And I think that's a big part of what's going to make today special. So thanks a lot for that, Hannah. Um, finally, we have our local druid and fearless leader, Andrew Simon. Could you give a quick introduction? Sure. Thanks, Chris. Um, I'm Andrew. I'm an ecologist. Or I, I like to identify as a naturalist, so I'll join um, I'll join Pam in that. I, uh, I curate a biodiversity project on Galliano, and that was really one of the major sources of inspiration, just seeing the incredible resources that exist locally to do biodiversity research. And um, yeah, so many people here in the Galliano community and even beyond throughout the region. Um, yeah, that was a source of inspiration for Immerse and what brought us all together about just over a year ago um, to form this organization. And it's really, it's really exciting to see uh, this meeting of minds here today, and I'd love to see more and more of this actually in the future, just thinking about our, our communities and, and the connections that are possible. That's, that's our mandate um, to foster these connections. So thanks everybody for being here today. Cool, and you're definitely gonna hear a lot more from Andrew um, later. Uh, I'm Chris Krug. I'm the interim chairman of the board here at Immerse. Um, I think of myself as the M part of the Immerse, the multidisciplinary part. I'm an artist and activist here on Galliano Island with a background in photography and online community building. Um, I'm currently working for the local First Nation here on Galliano, the Lalem Sarah Taneo, the Coast Salish people of Galliano Island of the Penelicate tribe as their communications and outreach manager. And they've got me up to some interesting collaborations with the Conservancy and other stuff. Um, uh, Andrew, just to confirm, we'd also maybe like the um, directors who are up for nomination to introduce themselves as well, the ones that are here. Uh, let's do that at uh, the end of the AGM. Very good. Weapons. I guess yeah. just, just to say then, the five people that introduced themselves, we've had a couple board members resign this year, Mark Weber and Arian, but they helped us get off the ground very strongly. But the five people that introduced themselves here are an all volunteer board. We meet monthly. Um, we have long working sessions and everything that's been done so far has been done by those folks plus a group of volunteers. Um, and we're excited to be adding a few more directors to that uh, mix this year to grow the board a little bit and to spread out some of the workload and bring on additional expertise. And so, yeah, you'll learn more about that soon. Just switching over to the agenda here again. Okay. I have some slides, I'll throw them up just for this to help it structure it a little bit. All right, um, so next up here on the agenda Oops. is Janine Georgeson, 
Um, Janine has been collaborating with us on a whole bunch of projects. And uh, I'll just give you a chance now to introduce yourself and to bring forward your strategic planning process report, as well as some information about the ecocultural mapping project. Uh, Chris, can you hear me? Yeah. Uh, I think it's Pam first on the agenda, just taking note. She's the financial report. I see. Yeah, I jumped ahead. So, and um, can see people see the uh, presentation that I set up? Yes. Okay, great. There you go. Okay. Next page, Andrew. Okay. <laughs> Hi, I'm going to assume this was sent out with the AGM notice. I'm going to assume everyone has had a look at it. Um, and Pam, I have to interrupt here. Sorry, sorry. Um, Chris, <laughs> I think we're supposed to follow the agenda and the, it begins with the approval of, of the agenda and motions, etc. to do so. Uh, okay, so at this point, I need to switch over to this other document. I got gotcha. you. Um, okay, so that actually, uh, those introductions were our formal roll call. And at this point, I would like to entertain a motion to adopt the agenda for the directors. I so move. Any objections? Okay, the agenda carries. And um, secondly, we need to adopt the minutes uh, from our previous board meeting on July 28th. Those have been sent out to everyone. Uh, I can hear a motion for that now. Uh, we don't have minutes from our previous AGM. It's not on our agenda. So I don't think we have to do that here today. We're good. Very good. All right. I am looking at the wrong agenda then. <laughs> We're on uh, now to the uh, presentation of the year-end financial report. So that's over to Pam. Very good. And the okay. presentation slides will start. Good. OK, I'm back. Um, at this early stage in our organization, a financial audit is not necessary. If there aren't any questions, I would just like to move that we accept my report. <laughs> would somebody good. like to second that? Hannah, objections? Motion carries. Awesome. All right, I believe up next we have Janine reporting on the strategic planning process and the MIT award and the ecocultural mapping project. Hi everyone. Uh, thank you all the speakers and all the organizations that went into this meeting. I am going to talk about Immerse's strategic planning process first. Immerse Strategic Planning and Fundraising Committee has successfully raised $5,000 of seed funding to support our strategic planning process. Which, we, which will be matched with a $5,000 grant and aid funding from the CRD, which we have been pre-approved for. Thank you to those involved in the process, Daniel Kirkpatrick, Nancy McPhee, Aryan Van Asselt, Patrick Ramsey, Mark Weber, Chris Krug, Libby McClellan, and Andrew Simon, and to all the donors who contributed to this cause. Nancy McPhee and a fellow volunteer are stepping up to lead us through a strategic planning process beginning this fall. Both volunteers are highly experienced in strategic, in strategic planning, and Nancy has facilitated this process for other local NFPs in the past. Now on to our ecocultural mapping project, Hethagum. In November of last year, we initiated an ecocultural mapping pilot project focusing on Retreat Cove, Hethagum in Hokaminum. In partnership with White Swan Environmental, a Lummi First Nations Environmental NGO, and the Vashon Nature Center and the Inclusive Design Research Center, with funding from the Southern Gulf Island Community Resource Center. <clears throat> the premise of this project is an MOA developed through the SOS Coalition proposed by White Swan Environmental. The coalition is a transboundary US and Canada society of individuals and organizations, both indigenous and non-indigenous committed to upholding the rights of indigenous peoples and nature in the ancestral homelands of the Salish Sea. The coalition supports an emerging group of indigenous inherent rights holders who are looking to establish parallel, establish parallel education and legislative systems based on the natural laws, inherent rights, kinship values and knowledge democracy. With the support of 10 volunteers from the Community Resource Center, we have compiled an ecocultural database of over 200 culturally significant species, including their Hokaminum names and values, many of which have been documented through their ongoing biodiversity research at Hethicum. 
The database integrates with a GIS map we have created as the basis of an interactive online story map we are creating in partnership with the Inclusive Design Research Center. It's really cool, you guys, to watch it in action. Um, our outreach continues with the community members and advisors, including Penelicate Elder Florence James, who we hope to host on Galliano soon. The next steps for this project will be weaving in the Hokaminam language education program guided by Levi Wilson and Emily Menzies to add spoken Hokaminam names and other content to this resource. Continuing outreach with other Indigenous knowledge holders and community members with connection to Retreat Cove and completing the pilot project with our collaborators at the Inclusive Design Research Center, who will create a prototype ecocultural map as a model to inform future work in partnership with White Swan Environmental. And now I would like to congratulate White Swan Environmental for being shortlisted for the MIT Fellowship Award. The MIT Saul Fellowship Award will offer publicity and support for the important work White Swan Environmental is doing. White Swan Environmental is also shortlisted for a Washington Sea Grant, which will also provide support for Immerse's role as partners on their ecocultural mapping project, focusing on English camp, I can't pronounce the, the indigenous name properly, San Juan Island, which will take place over two years from 2022 to 2024. And that is all for me. Thank you very much. Awesome. Thanks a lot, Janine. Uh, geez. Oh, you can hear me. <laughs> Thanks so much, Janine. All right, so it's my turn to give a brief presentation of some of our programming. I'm not going to have time to go through everything. Um, we have a great website, so our um, membership. Andrew? Yep. Uh, if we are determined to go according to this agenda here, I'm next. Oh, that's right. You get to uh, facilitate some Q&A. Like. Uh, yeah, and also my communications report is next also on the agenda. Oh, right. Um, <laughs> Does anyone have any uh, questions or feedback for Janine? That's a lot of cool stuff she was talking about there. Um, but this is a chance if you want to either in the chat or to pop on your mic um, to ask any questions to Janine about the her presentation. You're going to have to pipe right up if you want to talk now. I just wanted to say hi, Shka. And I think the word for English camp is puppy Alice. And um, I was also going to ask, how do you know or how do you connect with the tribes like out in the different areas to get their languages into the map project? There is, am I still on? Yeah, there is a, there's dictionaries from the different na uh, nations around us. Um, there's, where's the whole Camino one that we use, Andrew? I can't remember the name of it. Well, we, were, we began with the Hulk and Vietnam ecosystem guide and some of the Nancy Turner's work as well. Yeah. And then, yeah, we've outreached to other nations with, with because I, I have, well, both Andrew and I have connections with the different surrounding nations that have territory here or claim Galliano as a part of theirs. Thank you. Thanks for speaking up there, Sadie. Anyone else want to address Janine before we move on? Plenty of time if you want to. All right. Well, if we missed you because you're being shy, just pop your question into the chat and we'll um, we'll get it answered for you. Um, I'm going to go ahead and report on behalf of the communication subcommittee. This committee was chaired by Andrew Simon for a part of the year. And then when I switched over to the um, chair role, Andrew took over the subcommittee and we're gonna be switching that back, I think eventually, but um, I'm gonna be reporting on it today. But I really wanted to start by just saying thank you to, uh, we got a really good crew of volunteers who have joined this subcommittee. Um, Erica Priest, Sidra Triel, Justine Apostolopoulos. We are our newest member, James Turwitt uh, Drake, Sir Francis Drake. Emily Adamchuk, who you heard talk today, as well as Siobhan Schenk. Um, thank you very much. You know, it is a bunch of work that we pulled together and, and we couldn't do it without you. This year we've established, you know, everything has been spun up this year. So we've built a Facebook, we've built an Instagram, we've built a Twitter, we built a YouTube. Um, in fact, as we're talking today, if you guys want to go find those things, find Immerse or Immerse Labs on Instagram and Twitter and Facebook and make sure that you're following along and possibly, you know, share those out. 
people that help us grow those channels, which is something we're going to be trying to do over the next year. But we've got those set up now and, you know, we're announcing things like the MIT award there and um, um, other accomplishments by our members and partners and stuff. So not only would I request that you follow along, but I also request that you send interesting, relevant information about the projects you're working on to, the, to the, those channels as well via private messages or otherwise, so we can share the good work that's taking place within our membership and with our community and stuff and really shine the light back down on everyone who makes up the Immerse family. So um, yeah, we want to hear about what you're up to. Please send it our way. We've also started a, an email newsletter, uh, and we've been using that to send out news and updates, and we're growing that list as well. So if you're if you're not on that um, that list, please join up. And then I've got one more um, note from Andrew here. It says in late 2020, Immerse also brought forward a delegation to the Island Trust Council with recommendations that the Islands Trust require both engagement and capacity building with the local communities and First Nations for all future and environmental cultural research in the trust area. Andrew, do you want to make any comments about that? <laughs> yeah, I was just going to say. Uh... As an NGO, I guess we're not allowed to do too much advocacy, and I guess that was really the extent of it this last year. We brought that uh, delegation forward. Um, I have not really heard back from the Islands Trust about how they um, move forward with that recommendation, um, so we don't have an update on that yet this year. Um, but yeah, thanks to, I think Emily was involved and Janine as well in bringing in that delegation forward. So it sort of put us on the map as far as the Islands Trust is aware. So I can uh, entertain any questions now to myself about communications work or anything of that nature, if anyone has one. All right, hearing no questions, I'm gonna move on, but you are welcome to pop them into the chat and I'll address them. Andrew, you're up. Thanks so much, Chris. Um, yeah, so thanks so much everybody for being here. My name is Andrew, I've already given my introduction. So I'm just going to provide a brief overview of some of our programs, um, including some major milestones and next steps. Um, so I only have time to speak to a few of our initiatives, but I uh, encourage our membership to check out our website. It, and there's a good overview of our projects there. And please yeah, ask questions, inquire if you have any questions about what we're up to. And uh, once again, thanks to all our members, to our funders, to our volunteers, our advisors, community members, um, everybody who's made the work that we, we're doing uh, possible. So the first update I have relates to uh, the BioGalliano project, which was, as I mentioned earlier, sort of a font of inspiration for Immerse. Um, the latest uh, milestone for this project uh, is uh, our first article, it will be the first article sponsored, I'd say, by Immerse. Uh, was recently submitted, uh, which documents the last century of marine biodiversity research around Galliano Island, uh, which is to be published in the Biodiversity Data Journal. This uh, paper focuses on marine zoology and was prepared with the help of 17 co-authors, some of whom are here today, uh, including many regional experts in marine biodiversity. This paper is the first installment in a series intended to establish a formal baseline record of Galliano Island's biodiversity, while at once advancing a biodiversity informatics framework to help other communities uh, with the cause of local biodiversity research uh, throughout the Salish Sea. Uh, we were recently, we had the opportunity to present this work at a seminar organized by scholars affiliated with the Hakai Institute. We shared this link in a recent newsletter um, in case anybody would like to check it out, it's online. So this uh, forthcoming paper is just the beginning of a longer term project that involves over 50 biologists, several computer scientists, and hundreds of people who have contributed to the Biodiversity Galliano Island project. So it's a great expression of, of the mandate um, of our organization. Uh, through this work, we hope to inspire and inform the efforts of other communities throughout the region with the vision of creating, in the long term, uh, an atlas of Salish Sea biodiversity. So many thanks to everyone who's supported this work, especially our co-authors on this paper, which we hope to see published soon. Our next paper is going to focus on marine algae, including the hundreds of species of diatoms that uh, Mark Weber, who's not here today, has documented. And I just thought I'd throw this in here as a note. Uh, you've seen our logo. It's sort of an ad hoc logo that we threw together uh, for now. And that is this beautiful diatom in the genus Lycmophora. Here it is imaged by Mark Weber. So I'll go through these programs and um, I guess ask for questions at the end. 
Um, the next one I wanted to feature was our microclimate monitoring effort, um, which is focused here on Galliano and Valdez Island. Uh, through the study, we aim to develop a better understanding of local scale controls on microclimate, including topographic, latitudinal, and oceanic effects. <clears throat> These data can help land managers and ecologists better anticipate the differential outcomes that climate change may have for both human and ecological communities across this coastal landscape. I think that with the advent of this recent heat dome, um, this, these data that we've collected over the last three or four years now are more relevant than ever. Uh, we have the monitoring is ongoing with support from BC Parks Enhancement Fund. We've received two grants so far for, in support of this work, so thank you to them. Um, we're right now working on some preliminary analysis, doing some data quality control and assurance with support from Dr. Daniel Moore at EBC. And we're also developing some questions for hypothesis testing around this recent heat dome. Uh, so once again, many thanks to everyone who supported this program as volunteers. Uh, Kevin Toomer is not here, has been really involved and for hosting monitoring equipment on your land. And so finally, I'm just going to give a brief update on our ongoing efforts to document uh, a number of elusive plant species on Galliano Island. Um, so based on the historical data that we've compiled for the island and more recent search efforts over the last six or seven years, we've narrowed down a list of 14 plant species that have proven elusive and may be at risk of extirpation. Through the combined efforts of about a dozen people over the last couple of years, so far we've logged over 80 hours of search effort targeting historical sites and potential habitat for these species across Galliano. Um, five out of these 14 species we've found, um, and the remaining nine species are still at large, uh, several of which have likely been extirpated from the island. So this establishes a protocol that other communities can follow based on historical baseline data and through the use of tools like iNaturalist to log contemporary observations, followed by more expert search effort to detect uh, species extirpation, but also ecological change more broadly. Um, we're grateful for the support from the BC Conservation Data Center, the BD Biodiversity Museum, and, and many botanists, including Dr. Quentin Cronk at UBC, for the support of this project. Mm. And we'd also like to remember on the right here, we have a photo of Hannah and uh, the late Harvey Jansen, who passed away this year. Much of the historical data uh, that's available for the Southern Gulf Islands uh, is attributable to Harvey's work documenting the flora of the region since the 1970s. And that ends uh, my report on the programs. Thanks a lot, Andrew. Um, this is a time for some questions uh, for him, if you'd like. There's a beautiful shot of Harvey doing what he loves with Hannah there in the background. Pretty sweet. Okay, moving on. So I get to keep talking. Sorry, everybody. <clears throat> so just a quick summary of what's on the horizon for us this coming year. Uh, we're looking uh, forward to our upcoming board retreat, which will commence this strategic planning process facilitated um, with the help of Nancy McPhee and another volunteer who stepped up. So thanks thanks so much, Nancy, for helping to facilitate that. Um, that's gonna be a big focus over the next year, um, thanks to the seed funding um, that we've received from our donors and this grant and aid that we're seeking to the CRD. We're um, still at the early stages of exploring some important partnerships with the Hakai Institute and other organizations, including uh, Lelam Saratineo, the Coast Salish People of Galliano Society, through which we hope to increase capacity for the realization of our mission and our mandate. Um, we are planning to continue our micro explorations SEM outreach program, which has been great. We've only had a couple sessions so far, but as you saw earlier with Elaine, her presentation. Um, I think it's a great way to share uh, insights into uh, various research projects and just natural history more generally. Um, it's been a lot of fun so far. And yeah, we have programs coming up with the Galliano Conservancy Association and potentially some new funding opportunities on the horizon. So we're gonna chase after those. Uh, we're also planning a foray in October uh, focusing on lichens and bryophytes. Uh, this foray will engage a number of experts uh, in this field, 
uh, where we're going to supplement or add to our baseline inventory of the lichens and bryophytes of Galliano. And ultimately, this goes into our, our, um, our baseline inventory of the, the biodiversity known to the island. Uh, partly because of COVID, it's going to happen a bit later in the season. We're not going to promote this foray as a big public event, but we'll explore some other ways of sharing outcomes with our membership and community members. Finally, um, Immerse uh, is seeking to partner with an organization to complete a, a large three-dimensional model we produce of the Salish Sea, or most actually more, more accurately, the Southern Gulf Islands. Uh, this impressive one by 1.2 meter square uh, 3D model is produced by James Turwitt Drake, who's present here today, I think. Um, thanks, Drake. It holds significant value, and we're hoping to use this model in our outreach, but we can't do so until it's completed. We want to paint it, ideally. Uh, so yeah, if anyone in our membership has ideas for potential partnerships that could help support the completion of this model, we'd we welcome your feedback. Yeah, I'd like to add to that as well. We're also looking for potentially a semi-permanent or permanent home for the model. So, you know, this is a, a large tabletop size relief map of the Gulf Islands. It's beautiful. It's going to be even more impactful when it's um, completed. So, you know, Adam, maybe you'll think I've got a spot for it up at the Conservancy and some funds to help us complete it, or, you know, maybe someone else out there within our network. So, um, let's find a home for this, this uh, 3D model where people can visit it and see it and explore it and we can um, find the money to finish it off. So um, if you haven't seen it, talk to Andrew, you, you gotta check it out, it's pretty awesome. Um, you, your, your understanding of the bioregion definitely increases greatly standing in front of this 3D map, so. <laughs> Does anyone else have any questions? Pop them into the chat as I move on, okay. Pam is going to lead us through the election of our directors. Uh, one second. So should we, is there a motion to adopt the reports or Pam, what do you, no, I mean, but for our general reports, I don't know, from the membership, I think there's like a, there should be a motion at this point to approve essentially what we've been up to. Is that correct, Pam? Nancy's got um, hand up. What's that? Nancy. Yes. She has her hand up and what I'd like to be acknowledged. No, I just wanted to make the motion. Okay. okay. Accept the reports as presented. So you Thanks. just need a seconder and then uh, everyone in favor and you're done. Very good. I can second that. The motion is seconded by both Pam and Elaine. Is there any objections? All right, the motion to adopt the reports carries. Over to you, Pam. Thank you. You, Chris, um, as Chris has already told you, we have five active directors this year. We started out with seven. Um, Mark Weber and Ariane Van Ossel, um left at different times earlier in the year. Just too, too many obligations and you got to let go of one. But they are still members and we are very pleased with that. Um, we have... Um, four new directors today. I was going to put them off of the spot because we're all up for um, election, all the directors, including last year's directors. And so I was going to have us all introduce ourselves, starting with the past or present directors. But Chris, you already had us introduce ourselves. So I'm going to go straight to um, the, the directors that we um, have uh, hope to bring on this year um, and I'm going to ask you all to introduce yourselves and excuse me if I slaughter your names um, starting with Kieran Hohendorf. That was great. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Hi, I'm, I'm Kieran. I'm calling in from Vancouver today. Um, I guess I'm a forest restorationist. Um, the forestry background, um, my, I'm from Germany originally, but uh, my sort of connection with the Gulf Islands started on Galliano as one of the German interns for the Conservancy there. Um, and I keep coming back. Um, I've made a bunch of good friends on the island all along the way and just really loved, or started to love the, the Salish Sea um, bioregion. Um, 
Yeah, I guess. Yeah, my, my, my as I said, my background sort of in forestry and more terrestrial um, ecology based based around the, the big trees. Um, yeah, I'll leave it at that, I think. Thank you. Sounds good to me. Um, Ruth Waldick, is Ruth here? Ruth sends her regrets. I got an email from her. She's on leave, so she's missed our AGM, unfortunately. Okay. Could you Maybe. tell us a little bit about her, Andrew? Maybe Hannah can. I think she's closest. Okay. Yeah, I can introduce Ruth. Um, so Ruth and I have worked closely together on um, edu community educational resources around uh, for uh, coastal Douglas fir forest stewardship. Um, she's an ecologist uh, who's very, very active in um, uh, climate action and kind of implementation of, um, of that within communities, um, especially around uh, forest and soil health and uh, looking at changes around drought and um, fire risk. And uh, yeah, she's a wonderful and extremely enthusiastic and creative person. Perfect, thank you. Um, Emily and Dazyak or something close to that. <laughs> <Just I hope>. <laughs> <enough>. <laughs> Thanks, Pam. Um, my name is Emily. I'm a community ecologist. I I guess since its inception, but I, I initially, um, yeah, my connection to Galliano started during the BioBlitz a couple of years ago, and I've been involved in various projects since, and I'm looking forward to working with all of you. Thanks, Emily. And not on purpose, but the easiest for last, Levi Wilson. I think I saw Levi here. Yeah, I'm here. I've rarely ever been called the easiest, though. E. Tepoelio, Enthepe, Levi Wilson. Uh, by status card, I'm a member of the Giga at First Nation, but I have a lot of family history and ties to the Gulf Islands. And if we were allowed to have uh, all of our connections acknowledged, then, then I would have both of them acknowledged on my card, but I'm not. Um, I'm a teacher teaching grade seven at Colquitt's Middle School um, in my fourth year of teaching. And I've been hanging around the outskirts of Immerse for a while as, as Andrew's been trying to, to keep me as engaged as he can, not so much as much as I can, but I'm excited to be in a place where I can start to contribute and help out. Awesome, thank you. All right, um, so that that is um, our slate for the directors for the coming year. That's Andrew Simon, Chris Krug, Elaine Humphrey, Hannah Carpendale, myself, Pam Jensen, Quirin Hohendorf, Ruth Waldick, Emily Amdesic, and Levi Wilson. At this time, I will ask if there are any other nominations from those in attendance. Going once, any other nominations? Going twice, any other nominations? going three times. So by acclamation, I present to you the new board of directors for Immerse. Thank you everyone for joining us in just about doubling our, our, uh, our board of directors and our workforce. And I hand the meeting back over to you, Chris. All right, too cool. Welcome everyone. Welcome new directors. <laughs> um, Okay, this is a time for question and answers or any sort of statements that anyone wants to make. We just have a few minutes of kind of open floor time here. Um, if anyone would like to speak up. Uh, this is a good chance for me to remind you all to go ahead and email Andrew your um, membership fees for this year, 20 bucks, um, to ADF Simon at immerse.org or you can go to our website and click on the paypal link and send anywhere between twenty dollars on the lower end or as much as you want on the upper end that way i want to thank our speakers again from today it was really amazing brought a lot of life to this meeting i want to thank the other directors for all the hard work you've done this last year especially andrew for keeping pushing this thing forward 
know we've had lots of ups and downs. Um, Mark and Ariane getting us kicked off on the right foot uh, was amazing contribution and and trend, our young organization transitioning through their departure, um, you know, presented its challenges, but I think we're stronger than ever. And I'm just uh, really happy to be a part of this. Thanks everyone for joining us here today. Looks like at least on Galliano, the sun's out for a while. So once we log off, we should go enjoy it because we know how long it will last. Anyone else want to make a closing statement? I have a closing statement. I have a quick note about the website. There's a glitch right now. The menu is showing some weird characters. The donate button is a U. <laughs> we'll try to fix that. Um, uh, yeah, if I was to make a statement, I just thank everybody for their presence here today and especially our directors and volunteers and our incoming directors. Thanks so much for making time in your busy lives to be a part of this. And our speakers, of course, thanks so much for what you brought to this. Yeah, shout out to Daniel Kirkpatrick for the help that he's been, both to Andrew and to the rest of the board this year. A special note to Nancy, thank you very much for supporting Andrew and I, Nancy, as well as the board more generally. And Janine, we love you. Obviously, we want to do as much stuff as we can with you. Sadie, thanks for coming and talking today. Sir Francis, uh, I, great, beautiful map. I can't wait to finish this thing off. Chris, I've got one more, if I could break in. We need this to um, say thank you to Barb. And I don't know how you say her last name, Andrew, but she set up the financial records for us and did a spectacularly amazing job. So big, big thanks to Barb. Um, Barb, go ahead, yeah. Mike, go ahead. And Mike and Ed, you know, you've been there since the beginning. We thank you for your support and guidance, leadership, uh, especially as us young leaders transition into um, running this organization. We have leaned on you and we appreciate you being there for us. Lauren, thanks for everything you do. All right, I would accept a motion to adjourn this meeting. Nancy, seconded by Andrew. Anyone object? Over and out, thank you very much. Immerse AGM number one in the books. Thanks, Levi. See you later, everybody. Well thank done, you. everybody.